Welcome to Show Studio. The Couture shows have started. I left Paris this morning to talk about Paris in London, which is quite funny, because I came back from the men's shows. Um, we're going to start by talking about Dior, which I think is the kind of the big one this Couture season. Uh, it always is in some ways, because the brands are such a beautiful sort of Couture offering, but also because they've got Maria Grazzi-Turi, who was previously at Valentino, is their new creative director. This isn't her first collection for Dior, she did a ready-to-wear collection, but it's her first Couture collection. Um, so lots to talk about in that sense. It's very interesting that Dior have a female creative director for the first time. Um, they've kind of a mixed response, I think, to her ready-to-wear. Um, it was a very sort of definitive sort of feminist message to t-shirts, you know, we should all be feminists, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So they're really building a lot around the narrative of her being a woman, so I think there is a lot to talk about. Um, but before we dive into our discussions, I'll let my fabulous set of women introduce themselves, starting with you, Deborah. Um, I'm Deborah Milner, and I'm a couture designer. I'm Jane Lewis, creative director at GOAT. I'm Hilary Alexander, editor at large for Hello Fashion Monthly. I'm Shona Marshall and I'm a curator. <laughs> yes, I am. Sound like I was going to say something else. <laughs> Just that. You write nice things as well. I sometimes write things. Yeah. <laughs> so let's start, as I said, by just talking a little bit about the appointment um, of Maria Grazia at Dior. What do we all make of that? Um, obviously, the fact that it's a female designer at such a sort of established, huge part of the fashion industry that as a brand that Dior is, what, what do we think of that appointment? Hilary, what's your take on it? Well, I think it's astonishing that there hasn't been a female designer there before. Mm. And it's taken, what, more than 50 years yeah. for a woman to be at the helm. And when you think back, you know, about the time when they appointed Raf, for example, there must have been women out there. Mm. I mean, well, I've always felt very... Well, it being Phoebe Philo and what have you, but then it ended up being Raph Simmons. Yeah, so. Mary Catranzo, for example. Mm. Someone like that, I would have felt, you know, could have taken up the reins. Mm. But I'm thrilled that Maria Grazzi has got it, because I think she has a very... I know you said feminist, but I think at the same time she's very romantic mm -hmm. Mm. and womanly, and I think that really is the spirit of Dior. It's mm. not a kind of pared-down, minimalist... Yeah. Um, brand yes, at all. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Mm. So, yeah, tell, tell us your take as a sort of couturier. What, what do you make of it? And what did you, this is her ready to wear debut for the, for the house. What, what do you think of, of the aesthetic that she's sort of, that she's known for and that she's brought to do all? Well, I think, first of all, if you think what she did at um, Valentino with, I'm not going to get his name right, Pierre. Pierre Paolo Piccoli. Pierre Paolo Piccoli. <laughs> I mean, what they did at Valentino was really beautiful and following on from Valentino himself, himself which was very difficult. Mm. And I do think it's a really exciting appointment because she's, not just because she's a woman, but also she understands the high handwriting of couture. Yeah. And that means that there'll be someone at the helm of the house who really knows how to work in that environment. Mm. And so now she has a chance to do it on her own. Mm. And I think it would be really interesting to see what she's going to do. What's really interesting also to think about is she is, as you say, Hilary, sort of known for being very romantic. And you know, the Valentino's aesthetic was, you know, so copied in a way. Mm. And it kind of ushered in this sort of prim spirit that you saw completely across fashion. But it's interesting that both her and Pia Paolo, obviously, where they work so closely together, come from an accessories background, which I think is also part of what makes them so so interesting as a pair is that they managed to create fashion that seems so sort of beautiful and romantic and just, you know, truly sort of luxurious in the way that fashion is, but then they also have this really amazing knowledge of how to make a product sell, you know, like the rock star shoes that they did at, at Valentino. And I'm interested in her role at Dior and is she going to bring, you know, is there going to be like a Dior smash hit bag, for example, and what have you. It's, it's, I think that's what's really fascinating is that it's seeing how she's going to change it right down from the bottom products up through to the couture. It's interesting. That's a good point, actually. Might take her a while to, to let that, to get her feet under the table and let those, um, that those changes kind of filter through yeah. uh, into all the different categories. I don't think it's, in, I don't think it's likely that you'll see a, well, anything's possible, but it <laughs> takes time to create a, you know, smash hit in a particular yeah. area. But I think, personally, she did a great job on the ready to wear, and I think she'll do a beautiful job on yeah. the because I think she's just got a, you know, she's a feminist, as we keep saying, but she's she's got 
this romantic film. Mm. She's very delicate. She's got a very delicate hand. Yes, that's even true. though she has a strong message. Yeah, uh, she's you know she's making women's clothes for women yeah. in a, such a historic house mm. um, with so much history to draw upon. And they're wearable within, Absolutely. you know, within yeah. the context of couture. They are wearable pieces. You can see people wanting to wear them. Mm. Mm. I always felt when she and Pia Paolo were at um, Valentino that while they've been doing accessories, when you think about it, a bag is a relatively small mm -hmm. canvas. Mm. And yet then when they got the chance to do clothing, clothing. it was like unleashing Oh, yeah. Yes, there's so the much whole, the whole ground body. to cover. Yeah. You know, yeah. Embellishment, <laughs> instead of being confined yes. you know, to a clasp or a handle mm. or whatever, could be. And it was like they both sort of exploded. Yeah. I don't think I've ever been like particularly excited about handbags, but I am actually really interested to see what she does with Dior handbags because, it, in a way, Dior is a brand. It's slightly fallen off the handbag radar. Mm. Slightly, yes. there hasn't been like a, you Stuck know, in a rut, yeah, ex exactly. Like you think, you think Celine bags. You think, you know, Prince Shula doing the amazing PS One. But I think I would be interested to see if she does a really, really amazing bag. At some, obviously, we're not going to see it during a Couture collection. Well, um, I suppose there've been so many changes as well recently. Mm. So it's quite hard for a bag to have stuck in the last few years. I think it's hard for anything to stick. It's mm. like. Every, it was so funny being at the men's because it's like there are a few new appointments like Kaido Ackerman was in at Baluti and he did a really beautiful collection but you, you almost find it relatively hard to get excited about things because you're like oh for all I know next season it will mm -hmm. all change again you, you do kind of you know you think of the days where designers would do like you know you think of Karl Lagerfeld with Fendi and Chanel doing like 30, 50 years somewhere and now if a designer does like five that mm. seems really <laughs> like I remember when Kim Jones did five years at Louis Vuitton and it was it was actually really amazing because you're like, what other young designers yeah. like, do long that long haul. somewhere? So yeah. you hope that she kind of, because how long was it that Raph Simmons It's like two and a half years yeah. or something? Yeah. It's like there's nothing, you know. But if the boot fit, you know, maybe she'll, yeah. she'll get in there and get her teeth. But then yeah. the boot fitted with Eddie Simone at Saint Laurent, you know, mm. the boots fitted with so many people who've like, you know, there's all these rumours at the moment that Ricardo is going to go to Versace and you're like, why? You're doing a great job at Shaw. Yeah, just stay, stay where you, you are. are. Yeah. You know, but everyone's moving around. What's your take on it all, Shona? Do you like what she's doing? Yeah, I've, I always really, really liked what she did at Valentino. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I, I think the first collection was interesting. I, I think there were certain bits of it that, uh, on a personal level, I wasn't sure about. Yeah. <laughs> the slogan t-shirts, I'm not sure about. Yeah, then. I really want to talk about those in a minute. Um, but I think you're right to say that it's such a big job mm. and, um, you know, her CV really works for it. So I think, you know, I think that's, it, it, I think it's great. And I, I'm, sh I mean, I'm really shocked. We were just talking about it. Like, I never really thought about it, but how has there not Ooh. been another woman? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's fantastic in that sense, and she's a really wonderful designer. So I think, of course, she, she'll do mm. amazing things, but I think, like you said, she's got to kind of settle into the role. And mm. Shoes and handbags are a really big part of Dior, aren't yeah. they? You know, it's yeah. what Galliano really yeah. excelled in. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, advertising campaigns with Nick. and. I think it's exciting to see how that kind of shifts and it comes What did you really think of the advertising campaign? Because it's interesting that you mentioned that because it was, um, do we have that up, the ad campaign? Yeah, just getting it. Because um, it was shot by a female photographer, it was shot by Bridget Lacombe, and it was sort of very un Galliano, obviously, but <laughs> yeah. also very, um, very much about the clothes, I thought. And Dior, as you say, Shona, is a brand that is really, really known for their ad campaigns. And I found this quite, in some ways, kind of, um, Underwhelming, but I think it was always deliberately quite flat. You know, it was it was this kind of clean slate, nothing sort of bombastic and exciting. Is this like recent then? Yeah, yeah, this is oh, her okay. first ad campaign. Ooh. That's not that's okay. rough. <laughs> Get back. It looks quite editorial, even in yeah. the layout. Yes. Yeah. yes, it's very. Um, I don't know if I'm the right person to say this, but it looks quite trendy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like Says the curator. <laughs> I don't know. But you know, it does look like a magazine. Like yeah, a chic it does. Magazine. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, I think, for it, because it's not, you know, you, when you see a lot of fashion advertising, at the, there is this kind of, you know, there's the props and the set, and I think it's it's quite rare even to see, like, a, 
a fashion ad campaign that's shot in a studio. Mm. You know, you get really used to sort of the on location thing that has become really, really popular in fashion at the moment. You know, which is tied into the kind of realism trend which is happening, which is why I've talked about like JB Hawksworth and Holly Weir and Alison McClellan doing a lot of the campaigns, but often they're shooting on a location. So, you know, the McQueen one in the desert or the Mimi one where they're all swimming around. Whereas this the purity of this I thought was quite yeah. sort of striking and interesting. I think it's really arresting because it's less is more. Yeah. You know, it's quite unapologetic in that way. Mm. I think it's very it's very strong. Mm. I think it's tapping into that whole millennial thing as well because the mannequins or the models, you know, could be 17, 18. Mm. Yes, almost ageless and possibly. And no, very little makeup, you know, yeah. no sort of done hair. Mm. Mm. Very, very natural. But Valentina's always, I think, what's interesting when, when she was there is it's always been like kind of fetishistically youthful. And I think she's probably going to have to change that a little bit with with Dior, you know, the Valentina with the kind of the, the constant sheer dresses and it was very sort of nymph like and so wayfish and I wonder if, if with Dior that will have to feel a little bit more. This is just younger, isn't mm. it? Mm. Oh, I'm yes. just looking at this particular image and mm. to me this is just sort of we just I, I was here when we watched the show. Yeah. And and we said it might open up a new a new audience, audience. and I think this is uh, this is evidence of that, yeah, perhaps. Yeah. You know, this is really very, I think, very different. Well, because I think that's right as well, because it, what's interesting is, it, even though what Raph Simmons did there was so modern, it didn't ever feel particularly young. You know, those no. clothes felt quite impenetrable in some mm -hmm. ways and quite mm -hmm. unapproachable. I mean, I thought it was absolutely beautiful. I loved mm -hmm. it, but I kind of loved it as a voyeur. And I'm, you know, I, I wonder if how the consumer felt about it, because there is a certain sort of um, warmth to the Valentino aesthetic where it feels quite, um, it's quite cheerful, it's quite earnest, so you never feel that, it's not that kind of chilly thing that Raph did where it was almost too perfect to be worn. Whereas Valentino, because there's like bits of the embellishment and what have you, I always felt like her clothes were quite relatable and I think she's definitely brought that through to Dior. And I thought some of the accessories were really interesting, like the little chokers and mm -hmm. things like that. It felt very um, attuned to how young women were dressing. Yes, it's just softer. Very, sorry, Deborah. Yeah, I was just going to say it's just softer. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I think it still seems very much aimed towards the kind of Jennifer Lawrence sort of aesthetic, you know, which is not over glam. It's not mm -hmm. overdone. I mean, it's certainly not, you know, sort of Kardashian or mm. <laughs> J Lo or Beyonce <laughs> or Mariah Carey. You know, none of that. It's that very pared down natural, very, very young and modern look. Mm. Mm. The other thing I wanted to mention, apart from the fact she's a woman, she is the second Italian to head the house because oh, really? Gianfranco Ferre yeah. of course, was that's there. True. And it's interesting that they've always, they've never had a French person, or Mark, was Mark Bowen there for a while? Yeah, yeah but he was uh, after. Sam. There was Ferre, I mean, John Galliano, Raf, mm. all different nationalities, yet there yeah. never seems to have been. Like there's, no, there's not been a big long term French designer there. Yeah. Like Antwerp, British, what have you. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. It's also interesting because, like, the Italian thing is really, really important, I think, to her as a designer. You know, mm. Valentino, she would talk a lot about, like, Rome and the influence yeah. of Italy. And, and it's interesting, in a way, to think about that with um, her bringing that to a house which has such a history in terms of Paris. But I wonder if that's also just a modern thing, and that I wonder. I mean, maybe they do, but I wonder if if the sense of, you know, the global spirit of fashion means so much that there is this kind of cachet about being a French designer, you know, I don't know if there is that exists anymore. in the same way anymore. I think there's cachet around a brand, being like a British brand that yeah. sells to a mm -hmm. certain audience or a French brand, but I don't know, you know designers are from all over. If you look at the designs yeah. at London Fashion Week, like Mary is more like Greek, yeah. like everyone's from <laughs> everywhere, like, so I wonder. What did we think, Shona mentioned the We Should All Be Feminist t-shirt, what did we all... all Think of that. Uh, <laughs> your face. Well, I think she, there's no reason why she can't be political in yeah. fashion if she has something to say. As she says, it's a great sort of um, platform for being able to put a message yeah. across. I'm just not so sure if that, if they particularly resonated, just because slogans have been quite yeah. overdone. Mm. And I didn't like them visually so much, but that no, might be just my opinion. 
It's interesting what you say about slogans being overdone because it's a real trend at the moment. I was really prominent at the men's as well for these kind of vaguely, um, like quite pithy but meaningless slogans. Yeah. Where it's like, you know, I think it's slightly the Vetmore effect, you know, things like Justin mm. Forever mm. or like. Yeah. Things that kind of mean nothing. Yeah, it hasn't got any layers at all. No. That feminist t shirt. For me, I, th- yeah, it I think if Jill's going to do, or if she's going to do a t shirt, it should be a, in a goodie bag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, not on sale. No, I, <laughs> kind of, I kind of agree with you. If it was like a charity project mm, that they'd done, exactly. but there was something sort of. It just didn't quite fit. Yeah. But it's almost like print it on the invite. You know, use it as a slogan yeah. in a different way that's not on an object that's for sale. I did find that a little bit. But it's imperfect. Um, I think, you know, it's not, I agree with you, it's not sort of got any cachet no. or any real kind of uh, relevance. I credibility. Mean, yes, credibility. I mean, it's relevant, you know, today, this week, in the wake of everything that's going on. But it's kind of perfectly imperfect. It's a bit odd. Mm. It was the one thing in that show that was a bit like, oh. Actually, yeah, yeah that's sort a good of. point. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you know, she she'd played with a few conventions, I think, you know, with those jackets and the padding mm. and the... But, but this was just a bit peculiar, but maybe maybe it's meant to be a bit jarring and a bit... I think also... Underwhelming, looking yeah. at it with this tool. It's the complete opposite. I imagine, yeah, you can imagine it's one of those pieces of like, shall we or shall we? Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. But I also think it was part of a, a gradual thing which she did in that collection, which was bring branding back, which is something that obviously Raph Simmons hadn't really done, a, mm. well, hadn't done at all. And branding kind of going back to what Shane was saying about Galliano, such a huge part of that, particularly with the accessories and what have you. And it was interesting, you know, the little straps and the ribbons that she'd done that said, that had the dual wording on them. I thought that was interesting to see. So maybe the t-shirts were all kind of part of that, like returning the eye to being used to seeing sort of dual written on dual clothing, but. Yeah, I thought the, the boxer shorts and the bra straps, it, they, they were quite jarring with me as well, but I didn't dislike them as much yeah. as perhaps I instantly felt for the t-shirts. Um, but I think it was interesting and I could, you could almost, I was thinking about it, you could almost see like Carrie Bradshaw in Sex and City wearing those your pants walking oh, around definitely. her apartment so there's kind of a shift to kind of harking back to those times yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess you're right we're not really used to seeing stuff like that so, no you know take no, the other big brands they don't normally plaster logos but I think logos are so back I think yeah. part of it is yeah. the Gucci yeah. effect like you're yeah. right there was these years where it was just like you would do you would not have a logo mm, on anything yeah. and then Gucci kind of brought that really back in firstly when they with the double G's but then also putting like Gucci on t-shirts. And then I think I thought it was super interesting yeah. that uh, at the men's show, Balenciaga, that when they did that hoodie that was like the play on the Bernie Saunders logo, um, but to have Balenciaga- But that was clever. clever. Um, I think I mean, it was, even if you didn't like it, it was quite clever. The it way was they clever, did but in the, in the huge fur that they did that said Balenciaga, I was like, this is, it's strange again to see these. I agree, it was clever, it was, it was but again, it's kind of what I was saying about the, the Slogans where it's kind of clever in this eye rolly way, you know, when yeah. someone makes a joke, you're like, oh, okay, well done, like you're that, that kind of. <laughs> yeah, actually, I didn't actually see it, I just heard about it. <laughs> so maybe if I saw it, I'd say no, something it, it else. Is, it is clever, but it is, it's good. It's, it's, I was just thinking about it just then when you were talking about fashion being political, and I was thinking about how it is really hard, and I think that's why people are leaning towards doing things that are sort of almost like slightly funny or a bit clever like clever is yeah. an interesting word like because that is kind of what the whole Balenciaga thing is is it's kind of a bit knowingly yeah it's clever it's kind of this little like in jokes and things that makes people and if you, you feel smart when you look at it because if you get the joke then you feel cool or mm. whatever but it's like people are much more inclined to be sort of like funny or clever than they are to be political at the moment I wonder if that just because it feels really really hard to marry that with working in an industry that's so much about commerce. I don't, I don't know. Don't you think Henry Holland does it best though? His slogans, they're funny and they're, they're in. Work. Yeah. And, and it works. But they're not political at no. all. Yeah. And they're Catherine Hamilton. And Catherine Hamilton, yeah. Didn't she, it yeah. Didn't yeah. yeah. When she did and it. that was political. And that was political. Yeah. Yeah. I do yeah. think it's really interesting if you look at um, designers like Demner, you know, a Vasalia. Yeah. <laughs> I like the Osiris um, Dictionary. Gosha Yeah. Um, I started to do some research on, on Russia and in, we won't get into that. Um, <laughs> and, but about style and, you know, obviously Demna's from Georgia. And I think it's yeah. really interesting taking these Western motifs um, being positioned in, you know, well, Balenciaga is a French house. Um, Vetman's based in Paris, but then Gosha Rubinsky chose to show in Russia. Yeah. How you take those Western kind of ideals and branding and 
all, all those things and you subvert them, it's almost so much more interesting, so much more to say because it's those designers doing it, but if it was yeah. someone different doing it. So I think that's the layered approach that you start to unpick and it mm. becomes really wealthy to kind of talk about it and think about it. You know, people saying about that Balenciaga men's wear collection looked like Walmart. Well, mm. you're certainly talking about it, aren't you? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting, whereas with, with, with the t-shirts here, I, I didn't feel there was much more to say. Yeah. I agree with you. It's yeah. not, it doesn't have a big message that resonates. I don't think, mm. but I, maybe that wasn't the point of that. I mean, you know, um, other collections that use it in that subvertive way, they're doing it very much for a yeah. purpose. Yeah. But, but I just felt that this t shirt was sort of thrown in, possibly just in the big mix. In the big mix. She, she, she had quite a lot of different aspects to that collection, mm. so it was just one thread. Yeah. But it was strange. I can think of, you know, Ray Kawakubo had done a t-shirt saying we are all feminists, yeah. or um, Junya. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would have more sort of credibility. But it is weird, I was thinking about that so much mm. this season, like the designers that have built up this cult of like intellectualism around mm. them, mm. where you will always think that the collection is smart, no yes. matter what it is. Yeah, conceptual. And, 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 and yeah, and mm. like if you don't like it, instead of being like, oh, I don't like it, you're like, I didn't get it. Yeah. And then it's Prada <laughs> and Ray Kawakubo, Junior. Yeah. Like, and I think J.D. B. Anderson has done a really good job of kind of moving himself slightly into that direction mm. as well, where it's like, you always presume that there is this amazing message going. It's almost like you, you wouldn't criticize, you know, the hype around yeah. that is so, Huge, and so I agree with you. I totally agree with you. If Ray Kawakubo had done that T-shirt, everyone would have thought it was yeah. incredible, and like, been like, oh, how amazing is she? You know, yeah. but there's something that makes it a little bit cringe when it's on a dual runway. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it is interesting. And then think of um, Hello Kitty, for example. I mean, if that had been <laughs> <laughs> an American or an English um, brand launching it, I mean, we'd think, oh, yeah. But because it was Japanese. It's then sort of considered to be real. Hey, cool. But it's things that are exotic. Sort of ironic. You know, like it's just association. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. Just, what, just our own yeah. placement and association, the value we, we give it, or, you know, or not. Yeah. Or maybe. Or take it away. The Asian market, that would be really attractive. True, yeah. maybe. And maybe the t shirt will sell so well. I don't know. I yeah, like it is interesting thinking about that, like, so much at the moment. Like, being at Fashion Week and speaking a lot to the buyers, is you realise, like, just how even like I always think th that I try and sort of widen my perspective because I like go to Selfridges or Harrods and go and actually look at what stores are buying and I do that as a sort of part of my research each season but then you realize that is a tiny tiny yeah, yeah. glimpse of yeah. everything um, and it's really easy to think that you you know we, fashion journalists do it all the time with like oh yeah but it's not selling and then but you realize they I mean it's just not selling the particular stores that are in London but yeah. what does that mean actually if you look all over mm, the world mm. and the, the things that people go for is just totally you know the, the collection is ha having to be so layered now because they've got to offer something to every single market and every single yeah. and you're right maybe that is the thing with Dior is that there's certain things that seem really jarring to us that are actually yeah very very natural so. I mean look at the Moschino collections you know for seasons past you know with sort of logos and images and yeah. things really only a sort of fashion slave mm. <laughs> with lots of money would wear, unless they were given it. <laughs> <laughs> should we look, should we, oh sorry, what were you going to say? I was just going to say it's difficult from a creative point of view, isn't it? Because also at the same time you need to be able to push things and make some mistakes and see if it yeah. works. And it's really difficult to then do every single thing perfectly and every outfit and the For whole aspect market. of the collection is perfect. And how much should you have to do that? I guess I th for selling a lot. Probably. Yeah, I think that's, but I think, the interesting thing at the moment is with Fashion Week is all these questions about, you know, what's the best way to show, how's the best way to show, like, I think it will mean that people kind of feel in some way, hopefully actually, like after a period of intense pressure, less of a pressure, and they feel that they can do things in their own way, so maybe it is that they don't show at all, or that they show, yeah. you know, men's and women's together, or that they show once a year, or that, you know, I thought it was interesting that the kind of thing that Calvin Klein have launched, because you know, the, the RAF Calvin Klein stuff started to like trickle out. And the kind of first thing that's everywhere is that is this idea of a Calvin Klein by appointment service, which is going to be available to everyone. So it's really using the language of kind of a small bespoke company for this huge brand. And I was thinking it was a real sign of how fashion is changing. Mm. And, and, and also, 
ideas of what people want and what a consumer wants are changing. That you know, they've obviously the Cameron Plan's a huge brand. They've obviously done a lot of research into what appeals to their client, and the fact that the first thing that they've really gone on out with is is a buy appointment service. I think it's really interesting, and I, I do think that's something that you're going to see more and more as people pulling back or pushing in different directions and maybe maybe the bespoke thing will have a slight more of a kind of moment particularly because young designers I think are, are feeling empowered enough to realize that they probably need to sell directly to their clients and not sell through stores because they're losing so much money that way and I think it's going to be so interesting over the next few years to mm -hmm. see how everything changes yeah, like it felt like such a, lot, a spirit it? of change at the men's did it well, yeah, the last day of men's, it was really funny because um, all the women's wear press arrived because Paul Smith, the show was at like four and it was a men's and women's show. So right. he's like stopped showing at women's wear, he's just going to show at men's wear. So it was like really weird because like, we were all in our little like men's bubble having a lovely time. And then we walked into the Paul Smith show, it's like been invaded. There were like, all these like women's wear press there and we were like, oh, God. But like it was like weird, but kind of amazing, really interesting to sort of... Uh, have those two different sections that show and then the Kenzo show was also men's and women's they literally did like two shows like they did a men's show and then all the men walked around and then all the women walked around right. that was a bit need to rethink that maybe whereas the Paul Smith show was much more mixed so to have that in the men's week you were like oh actually okay this is really like actually changing like there's a day where these brands were showing together are coming in and and like, and like everyone was saying that the Milan men's schedule felt really really strange because Bottega, Benetta and Gucci went on it because they're going to be showing together. So everything's in total, total flux. Oh, right. Um, very much so. And, then, and also there's some collections where there's stuff available to buy straight away. And like, you know, when you go see the Jonathan Anderson Lueve presentation, like he always unveils the campaign on the same day as showing people the presentation. So it's not, it's kind of a different thing to see now by now, but it's that idea of like it being a public facing thing. So all these different things are happening where you're seeing campaigns for different seasons at the same time and collections that you're seeing something that's available straight away and something that's not and then you're seeing something you're like, is that pre or is it women? You know, everything's just totally... I mean, apart from the logistics, it would be a good thing if you didn't have to be a slave to the show every six months or obviously more if you're doing different collections. I think so. I almost think it'd be... For some brands, how well would it work if, you know, they just showed when they felt like they had... Like, I was well, thinking with Comte de Gossel, imagine if, you know, Ray Carl Cooper did an amazing show every two years or something. Mm you know just when she because she's literally done shows about having no more ideas it's like <laughs> maybe yeah, shows, are begin you know. are begin uh, shows in their traditional format will become more obsolete I think because people aren't buying in that way anymore no. as we've seen stores aren't buying that way and it's all about you know c delivering to the end consumer and there's so many channels and it's a it's a really fast changing landscape and I think that people are more open within the industry to two different presentations to different channels to mm. access their customers and, and and customers accessing from that you know it's got yeah. to be a two way street it was a little bit more one way now Definitely. I think it's much more interactive yes and and so well the show's become like an ad campaign like sometimes you mm. are sat there at one where you can really see the live streaming cameras and you're aware mm. that it's a big brand and you almost feel like you're an extra rather than a journalist you're like <laughs> I am literally a bum on a seat to make this live stream look better for like the client who's watching this um, because it is that idea of like they need a video of a show because that helps them sell clothes. It's, it's yeah. collateral. Totally collateral. Are, yeah, and I think that's what's happening. Yeah. It's becoming a vehicle yeah. to create collateral for marketing, yeah. for sales. It's, it's a, it's a one-stop shop. Yeah, which, which has to be multifaceted. Yeah. Definitely, you know, it, you need the picture. Like the shows will always exist to an extent, even if it's like a fake show that no one actually went to, because you yeah. need the catwalk image of someone wearing it. Because you know, if you speak to a lot of, of stores, they say that you know, a client always loves the idea that something was worn on a runway. So yeah, you've yeah. got a lot that of stores. Cachet. That's true. It totally does, and you see that. You know, if you go on Net or Maxis mm -hmm. or whatever, a lot of them say like runway look. Runway look you yeah. know, so there's. It but gives it kind of credibility. You, you could just and then all the take a picture that looks like it was on a runway, and then like who knows? All yeah. the papping of you know, the audience yeah. and the sort of you know the street stylists and mm -hmm. I mean, which provides endless you know fodder if you like for websites for yeah. print for magazines. But I wonder. I mean, if the fashion show concept is changing as well itself, how long before we have robot models? <laughs> well, you know, because it costs. Didn't Chanel do something like that? It costs so much if you think about yeah. it. You yeah. Know, the hair and the makeup and transporting them and getting them all to the show on time yeah. on back of motorbikes. This is such things. a so virtual reality. You could have virtual reality. Just have robots putting on the clothes. And <laughs> 
Because <laughs> there is something about people like to see clothes on a real body. That's why Street Star did so well. <laughs> But some some robots look quite human, like those ones from Japan or wherever. Yes, they've got hair and they're all the, ones the that skin do and things. Cook for you and bring you a cup of tea in the morning. Maybe next season we'll watch the Dior show and she'll have done all robots and you'll be integrated. <laughs> Well, what was Chanel oh, yeah. last last season? Didn't they have some strange? There were two looking... robots. Last season. they yeah. made them wear like. Can you get a picture? Of the was shoe? it actually <laughs> a robot? Was it? No, or, no, no, just a no, person no, with a hat. I think it was a person with a hat. Fash bots. Fash bots. Yeah, fash bots. I want to show you. Was that. It the ready to wear? No, yeah. yeah, yeah, it was the ready to wear. Yeah. It was like the data themed ready to wear. Yeah. <laughs> Tom's like what? Because <laughs> they could put any face on them. Just Google Chanel robot and it'll come up. <laughs> but what did I see? I just saw one tiny picture on Instagram. No, but they Mew did Mew all the collection. Um, oh, so what you going to do? Did Mew just do something where they show on mannequins? Oh, really? I didn't see that. I don't know. I don't know enough about it, but I, I just saw one picture. There is a... I think, oh, here we go. There they are. Hilary, you're right. Oh, right. They're actually What in the... What, with the white... Things on, isn't yeah. it? The well, not the girls. Yeah. The girls. <laughs> I'm just checking. <laughs> That's a <Mika. laughs> <laughs> well, It'd be better if it was oh the girls God. in the middle. It's uh, like Star Wars, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Stormtroopers. Oh. I don't know if that would appeal to a client. You know, I don't. If, you know, it's yeah, for couture, like, is it? But this yeah. is just marketing, and yeah. this yeah. is just this is what makes us chat about it, right? Yeah. But couture, the, the the real clothing. We we were discussing this earlier. <laughs> is the absolute opposite of this. We're talking about all these shows as marketing vehicles, mm -hmm. etc. But Couture is the, is the cornerstone. Yeah. It's the absolute polar opposite of all of this. You know, it's, it's taking it, it back to the it Except, yeah, it's 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 except it that it tends to be the, the sort of the thing that then markets the whole of the rest of the yeah. brand. And well, all but, the makeup and all of the rest. But, they, but don't brands need that? Yes, I think definitely. definitely. They need they need one anchor. But yes. there is this sweet irony that it's meant to be about like handcraft and slow mm -hmm. fashion and you know this really intimate relationship between client and house. But actually, the couture shows sometimes, yeah, more, as you were saying, more than the ready dress shows are this huge marketing like mm. spectacle. Absolutely. When actually, it's meant to be the most intimate side of fashion. And then there's that weird thing where you go to the atelier and the stuff that was shown isn't the stuff that clients were ordering anyway, and they're yeah. making like. Like I went to the Valentino Atelier, I think I said this on the last panel, so it sounded like a broken record, but it was amazing. Like I just went to do an interview, it was when Maria Grazia was still there and they were like, oh, do you want to look around the, the Atelier? And I was in Rome and it was absolutely beautiful and incredible mm. and made me have, I just wanted to stay there and like mm. sew ribbons I've all day. I've been there too. It's incredible, mm, isn't it? It's amazing. Oh, God, but they I'd were making stuff that was like, like there were like three pieces that they were making that you could, they were making some pieces that I obviously mm -hmm. didn't see. Three pieces that I really recognised from the collection. You know, some had been tweaked slightly. But they were making this um, as a wedding dress, and it looked nothing. If you showed me a picture of the, mm. the woman who wore that wedding dress, it was beautiful dress, and said, "What house is that?" I could not have told you that it was no. Valentino, and it was obviously you know she'd come to them and said, "I want a dress." Didn't know why she chose Valentino. Maybe her mother had as well. You know, you never know what the reasoning is. Mm. I don't think it was entirely for the aesthetic because it didn't look like. Them. And, and that is what's interesting with all of this is is what the clients actually want and their relationships with the houses you know and what they order because it's not always what they're showing I mean you must find this no, I think it's a bit of a balance of both really mm. so I know when I was at McQueen that obviously they don't do a couture collection but obviously the elements of the collection are couture mm. and the other thing was how can we make something for the client that fulfills her wish but which also is McQueen yeah yeah mm. you know so but then those dresses kind of exist in this other world as well where you almost think you know I yeah does it matter if they don't relate to the aesthetic of the brand because no, who you know, it's not like they're going on a red carpet or something, you know, they're being worn oh. in sometimes quite intimate events, you know, teas or cocktails I think it's good if they, if they do. I think you yeah. should aim for that. It's not always possible because it depends on somebody's figure and what suits them. Why do they then come to a particular house? Like, did you have this where you'd almost have a client and you'd think, like, why are you out McQueen? If well, I think they like to think that they're getting some of that aesthetic okay. yeah. and that approach and, you know, yeah, and they want to be able to tell their friends that that's what they're wearing. Yeah. Even or else they know about the workmanship and, that's you know, the skills of the atelier in terms of actually making the piece for the client. Because yeah. I wonder so. for the real clients, like the real, real high, high clients, whether it's almost like a hairdresser, it's like, you're like, oh, I just like going there because, you know, she knows what I like. It just reminded me of something that 
Lee said, Alexander McQueen said, he said about wedding dresses that you're not meant, to, if you're doing a wedding dress, for example, it's not meant to be some big statement about the house. You've got mm. to look at the client and do something that's going to work and not try and do something that reinvents yeah. the wheel. And if he was saying something like that, yeah, that's, that's what really he genuinely felt. Yeah, that is interesting. So, so I guess then the catwalk show for the couture is almost like a proposition of ideas that the client I think it can is. play around with. And then, you know, obviously, they'll, I don't know what proportion they sell from the, from the actual show, but I think there's a proportion from the show and then there's mm. other things that are going to be developed or different. Mm. But maybe and using the new the tone for like their perfumes yeah. and their oil. Exactly, the doesn't, the it, yeah. doesn't it exactly do that to, mm. to really um, draw attention to the culture of a house, yeah. To, yeah. The, to the handwriting of the house and its integrity and its ability mm. and heritage and then from mm. that filters down into all the other areas yeah. Yeah. that becomes accessible because couture is accessible you know, to such a minute proportion yeah. of, mm. of uh, yeah. the population. Mm. It's not really obviously for the masses but, but it can spring off of that, can springboard all the yeah. all the smaller uh, makeup and bags that uh, that support the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it does it does help set the tone. Like, you know, looking at this, it's interesting because she didn't do a set for her ready to wear. You know, it was very white, very mm. minimal. And then this is obviously like crazy enchanted forest, yeah, like real looks, grass on the floor. But it definitely. reminds me of when Raph did his first yeah, picture show. You know, it's covered in all the flowers. Mm. Do you can you get a picture of that? But I wonder who was the set designer yeah. for this because I know that uh, Raffson's worked with Bureau Betak or yeah. she yeah. keep working with the same people. I, I always think it's really interesting how you bring these kind of characters together yeah. to make what represents the brand and mm -hmm. then it goes out to all the ad campaigns and you're picking person it really is a true creative director and it sounds yeah. a really stupid thing to say but you're not really a designer anymore in many yeah. ways are you? Yeah. So, um, well, I know that's that really Stephen Jones is still doing still doing the hats, hats, which hats I think and just, headwear, yeah, and, and there seem to be quite a lot yeah, I in this couture that. show. There does seem to be a lot, and that mm. is interesting because I think because he survived right, you know, from <laughs> earliest when yeah. John first started, yeah, yeah. yeah. through that's the rough era, through the era and, and then right yeah. through. I mean, why wouldn't he? He's so cute. You, mm. know, you wouldn't want to let him go, would you? But I, it is interesting that, that I think you know this was like a, such a spellbinding set and the mm. fact I mean I wouldn't say what she's done mimic, has mimicked it no, but it suggests it references it, it references, references it. that yeah. kind of natural world but wasn't that all about Christian Dior himself yeah, and his, his favourite flowers, flowers so yeah. Yeah. Mm. but then he loves like being in the garden so that's yeah. kind of you know the enchanted garden the enchanted yeah, so it's that natural work you know so very different to a Chanel set where it's much more about often interiors yeah. and grand mm. space, yeah. you know. Well, I read that she calls herself a curator. Oh, really? Uh, Marie Gretzi Chui, because she's looking at the archive and the history and she's picking things and making something new. That's, that's, that's quite interesting, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's interesting, interesting to call herself that, I mean. But, you know, I think you are talking about whether designers are designers or creative directors, and I almost think, even more so when they're in a house that is someone else's name and that has a big archive, they become even more of a creative director because you know, you, you've then got all that stuff that you have to pull in and mm. lean on. And if you think, you know, someone like a J.W. Anderson for years, even at his own lab label, has called himself a creative director and there he had no archival pressures to reference. Mm. But I think if you are in a house, it's just, you, you can't design afresh, you know, you have to be mm. pulling different bits and building collections around a, like existing stimuli. But do you think it's also to do with the volume of work that they have, so that they can't spend the time actually designing and developing yeah. the ideas themselves in the way that they might have done years ago? Maybe Balenciaga himself, for example, I when think he actually that made doing that many some of the shapes yeah. and things you don't himself. Like barely touch mm -hmm. the fabric. It's you know, just you, there's not time, say yes, it doesn't no, matter. Yes, no. yeah, if definitely. you wanted to do it or you wanted to sit there and cut the pattern or yeah. whatever, it's almost impossible, especially if you're the head of a house like yeah. this. I, I mean, where most of so my job, demands. I presume, will be like decision making, you know, yeah. and, and I think she's obviously someone who's good at working in a team because she had that amazing sort of duo relationship for so mm. long. But it will be, you know, trying to inspire the designers that are working for her and giving them direction and stuff. You know, you can't make every piece yourself. Which Can you imagine the luxury that, of time that Christian Dior had when he set oh up the God, house? Oh my God, I can imagine. Two collections a year. You know, you can really create. And you could actually spend six months yes. yeah. putting a collection together. Well, a lot of... The, a lot of um, when, there were, when there were all those rumours about who was going to go to Dior, a few quite 
senior journalists kind of this theory was going around that they were going to break it up and it was going to be like um, someone was going to take the couture, someone was going to take the ridge someone was going to take the accessories and really, really, because they were like, it's just too big a job for mm. one person. Obviously, she doesn't do the men's, Chris Van Ash does that, but I do think in a way, you know, that obviously that was just a kind of a rumour, I think yeah. it's completely untrue, but it didn't seem like the most bizarre of... Of, um, of suggestions, but then I guess houses just need a figurehead. I mean, that is how it operates. There is a different mm. person. And you need a continuity things. amongst all the sort of different yeah. aspects. And just someone that, you know, can talk about what the house stands for. Because if you're spending that much money as a client, you want to feel like you're buying into someone's vision, not like a sort of team effort yeah. in a way. It's somehow less appealing. I, mean, I suppose, in a way, it's like designing a, a new car. You know, the designer perhaps sketches it, but yeah, it has nothing to do course. with how the engines put the together mechanic, or yeah. the wheels or mm. just goes around the different departments or yeah I mean that was what was together. amazing about <laughs> Alexander McQueen because he and although I really I appreciated he did have a lot of pressures on him but he also did have the luxury of some time to spend creating mm. because I would remember we'd maybe go in on like after the holidays and he would have spent all the holidays cutting up things and twisting them around and actually cutting patterns not the full finished pattern yeah. but on the stands would be all the sculptures mm. of the things he wanted yeah. to make but so, so many designers but that's like, don't even, like Raph didn't even sketch you know mm. like they work by I don't know if you guys have seen Dior and I it's an amazing yeah. documentary but it, like he kind of yeah. works with mood boards and imagery you know mm. so some designers don't drape don't barely touch the cloth and that's kind of this new world of designing, isn't it? That's the big, you know, dilemma. Say with me now, where I'm sort of working <coughs> again on my own, mm. and wanting to have the time to sketch and to make the things. Yeah. Because if I don't, then yeah, exactly. Then I'm then just going to be doing exactly the same thing, just yeah. telling everyone else what, mm. to do what to do and orchestrating it and not having the time to do it. So I almost think it's for me better to be in a small, you know, a small, small environment yeah. where I might have a chance to do that. Well, it's yeah, still difficult. I think I said this on another panel, but I interviewed Dries recently, Dries Van Noten, and I kind of asked him if he thought he'd succeed if he was doing it today, and he kind of said that he wasn't sure, but he, he probably would have done something very small, and he liked the idea of, you know, a little made-to-measure thing that mm. you do, maybe you don't show, mm -hmm. you don't even do it in a key fashion city, and I think for people whose real love is the make and, you know, yeah. the fabric and the draping and the cutting and the construction, maybe yeah. running a big house isn't the kind of thing that you know, you'd enjoy. It's like, if you want to be an artist, you don't go and run a gallery, you know? So I think it is kind of, I wonder if that will change as well, like while all these shows are changing. I think it depends if you have a really strong team. Mm. I mean, because Alexander had a really strong team that yeah. could hold him up there. Yeah, so he could dabble on different mm. things. Should we have a look at the show? I'm conscious that we've got so much to talk about, but we've also got so much to see. <laughs> Time to go home. <laughs> I know. Can do the video? Yeah, let's see the video. Thanks for it. Um, so this, the show is kind of horoscope influenced. Um, apparently lots of Heritelio Gemini. I don't know anything yeah. about star signs. So do you know about star signs? Oh. I'm one of these people people always like, oh, the you're twins. Pisces. The twins. The yeah. twins. Oh, twins? Gemini. Oh, very good, yes. Yeah. Relates back to the campaign. But I swear she, they did star signs of Valentino as well. They did a they did a show that had a lot of the star sign <coughs> motifs on them. So that's quite interesting. It's obviously something that she's the set is absolutely amazing. It's gorgeous. Mm. It's but I wonder if the heels sank into the grass. You can see the... that I was watching a bit of the stream earlier, and they were like kicking it up. Really? Oh, it's, it's like Scottish stops. widows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the headwear is amazing. Yeah, isn't it wow. fabulous? What a great shape that can. <gasps> it's very oh, like, beautiful. It's mid, we've got pictures as well because the stream's a little bit jumpy. But are they culottes? They look it's so like simple, a block but here. so beautifully yeah. yeah. uh, executed. The oh, cut yeah. just and yeah. looks yeah. fresh. Oh yeah, yes. it doesn't look like we hashed the old shape. A modern. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. And their trousers are beautiful. I think yeah, they trousers are trousers, which is interesting because later it gets skirt. much more sort of feminine. But it's interesting the opening looks a little bit androgynous, which is quite similar to what she did with the ready to wear, where it started with like the fencing costume. So it's slightly about. Um, oh, these are like culottes. Mm. They're gorgeous. It's quite Midsummer Night's Dream, all of the little oh. fairy tale. But here's this idea of like fashion as a fairy tale, fashion as fantasy. You know, this is so kind of. That's beautiful. Fantastic. This is very so. clean. Yeah, this is very lovely. pure. Yeah. And beautifully tailored. Mm. Yeah, wonderful. Which is quite different. Oh, look at the headdress. My I God. know, they're amazing. 
It's quite it's different so to the um, Valentino thing. It was much more about you think of sort of sheer with embroidery and and surface detail where it's interesting that with the opening looks for this couture it's just really differentiated from Valentino by making it much mm. more of a tailoring focus and much mm. more about construction which is obviously mm. really a part of Dior. It's beautiful. But there's also quite a lot of you know waisted and then bigger skirt like yeah. the yeah. new look. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's also interesting that it's quite childlike you know like especially because of the costume the like crowns. the headpieces it looks like little <gasps> girls dressing up and she I think the way that they, she's always had this knack for playing with that kind of primness that comes with child, like innocence is something that she plays with in this really interesting way, which is something that was really sort of clear at Valentino. Wow. I like how it's set against this kind of ethereal, yes. wonderful kind of fantasy garden and so soft and fluid and then a lot of the clothes are very structured and tailored as mm. the opposite, I, I quite like that. Yeah. But it's oh. quite Fellini esque oh. as well. Or oh, the draftsman's contract. Remember <laughs> <laughs> the black and white and all the green. Why do you say Fellini esque, Trina? Just, you know, all those hoods and La Dolce Vita. And it's I'm, I'm really obsessed really like with it. the party scenes in Fellini films. You know, yeah. the extras, not really that necessarily yeah. Anita yeah. Ekber, but I think um, that feels quite Italian always, I yeah. think. That, that aesthetic that's slightly. It looks. Um, glamorous and fancy for, for your evening out, but then there's something slightly strange about it. There's always yeah. something interesting. Well, that, that, there is something about that to this where there is that little, it's, it's kind of that decadence of the, the kind of costume. Oh, it's great. It it. Yeah. I love the headwear. Yeah, it's incredible. And tied it's under, you know, like a little bonnet. But that's kind of weird. There's this weird sort of um, interplay between it being very sort of done and glamorous and, and a little bit awkward, you know, like slightly perfectly like... Perfectly imperfect. Yeah, perfectly imperfect, you're right. Oh. It is very... The only thing that I really don't like, and she did this with the with the Renator as well, is it's so white, you know, like the casting. It's like these young, young, mm, white yeah. girls. Mm. And I just don't think it's like... That embroidery was that... There'd be an octopus or something, or a jellyfish. There was a sort of oh, that golden a glimpse to gold thing yeah. with sort of tentacles embroidered on a skirt. I find this very fairy tale. I know, it otherworldly. Is. But they're specific-looking people. Like I don't know anyone who looks like that. So I don't know where she found all those people. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but I've got the similar hair, like kind of mousy blondes. Yeah. Um, very, very pale. Oh, there's thousands Ethereal. of models to choose from. Do you think? Oh, yes. I just don't know any of them, Hillary. But it, I mean, you could <laughs> say I want all redheads, and you know, yeah. 500 would apply. But it is, it is strange if you think that you do all such a huge global house, and oh, yes. it's slightly strange to have such a narrow vision of, of femininity in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, but there's different ethnic um, looks as uh, models as well. But not, not to like a no. we were significant talking, extreme. We were talking about shoes before. I really like all the shoes in this mm. show. But the little flats, flat, some flat. of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The bows. I really, I like You'd it kind of need those with that grasp. I know, yeah. you would. Uh, can you imagine all their heels? Yeah. yeah. yeah I think what Shona said lovely. about Bellini is super interesting, actually. This idea of kind of... You always look at this in, in the magic world that these couture clients must exist in. You know, you imagine these fantastical parties where you know these masked balls, these amazing mm -hmm. things that they go to. Um, whether that's probably the case or not, they're probably you know going to quite boring charity events, or what have you. But you oh, like to imagine that, and then you look at that, and you quite, you yeah. look at this, and you kind of imagine that. You imagine those. You know, I, I, I'm obsessed with like the Rothschild Cerulis Ball and you think about mm. all these amazing occasions that, oh, if I could go to and if I could wear a couture dress and, and this collection kind of encapsulates that in a really, really amazing way. I and the masked balls and Venice and things like... Yeah, exactly. There's an amazing heritage But if you were getting married and you had an awful lot of money, wouldn't you definitely go there? <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, and yeah. I think, it, you know, well, take away like being fabulous couture client every day and wearing these things every day. I think um, that is your one big chance, isn't it? Yeah, to yeah. wear something that's so fantastical and beautiful mm. and something you never dreamed of. So... The headpiece, I just think the headpieces really are well. so amazing. And yeah. they're not very Stephen as well, which is quite interesting. Yeah, that's true. You know, they're almost... When, you, when I think of Stephen, I think of such an incredibly blocked hat, you know, really beautiful. Whereas these, there's just something quite different about them. I think they obviously hurt Stephen and... 
and um, Maria Grazia obviously have a really amazing working relationship where they're sort of challenging yeah. each other and I also think it shows a huge amount of confidence yeah. from her that she's allowed the headwear to take such a centre story in her first couture show because it shows a confidence in the clothes yes. she's not worried yeah. about they are really allowing. holding their own these clothes yeah oh, but she, you know, a lot of designers yeah. have been like oh I don't want to do anything that's going to detract from my clothing yeah. why would I give another designer the spotlight oh, it's, only in how, it's only served to enhance the, no, the story that them. they are telling oh. Beautiful. They're amazing. I think Stephen must have had an absolute ball. Oh my god, totally. Stephen's his, his Stephen is so jealous. But they look like yeah. a lot of historical referencing, which is Stephen mm. Jones is so amazing. But, yeah. He, but you know, the pinnings and the underpinning of the chin and things is, looks like they've had really good time. Yeah. And like you said, Lou, it's kind of, well, I say bravery, but I think she's that kind of designer. She's almost quite modern and contemporary and bringing collaborators yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, it feels like that. And but I mean, to be part of a duo, you can't mm -hmm. be such an egotist yeah. anyway, no, you can't, can't be, because yeah. you would... And also, I thought they were very discreet as a duo, and that you, you never heard any rumours of, like, you know, this one does more of that, no. or this one's the real brain behind that. You no, know? it's true. But and those ostrich plumes, don't you? I mean, they could almost be, you know, from the Pigalle or the Crazy yeah. Horse or something. There's a sense yeah. of showgirl. But they look a little bit homemade. Like, obviously they do because they're exquisitely made. But there is something about the headdresses that I find really charming is that they look like... You Festival. Know, yeah, too. there is a slightly that thing of, you know, fashioning yourself this eccentric, mm. amazing look. You know those Glasto feather headdresses that <laughs> girls put on? Poor Stephen, he's like, he's like, <laughs> like a Glasto headdress. But do you know what I mean? It, it, it like plays with that idea of like dressing up, mm. you know, and, it, and I think that's really interesting. It takes away that, you know, it goes back to what I was saying about the Raft collections feeling so impenetrable, and this yeah. doesn't feel like it is the word it's imperfect. It's a light touch as well. There is this light touch, and there's this sense of fantasy around it which stops it's it from gorgeous. feeling like it's closed yeah. in a museum. It's divine. Oh, that music, isn't that from a ballet? Um, it's... Yes. What is this? Oh. A no, it's... Beast. Is it Stephen? No, it's... Um, Stephen oh. Beat? I think oh my god, I know exactly what this is and I can't place it. It's really They're really saying it's Beauty and the Beast, the girls Is it? There. Beauty and the Beast? It does sound like the Nutcracker. Is it the Nutcracker? One of the two. Got to read the sound. Sounds like childhood. <laughs> Have a check. Um, so we're really knowledgeable. I like how the headdresses are as well. I just think I do think it's absolutely beautiful. Oh, so I know beautiful. this music. Oh, I know it's really driving me mental. Yeah. Did anyone Was find it for it? a movie? No, it's definitely one of the ballets. Oh. I think it is the Nutcracker. I don't know. I think it is the I Nutcracker. I think it's a I ballet. It is. I was Nutcracker? watching something else. Yeah. 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 Nutcracker? Well, it's something of that. Or Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> I love them. Um, the tree in the middle is just like a wishing tree, which I just think is very beautiful. I just want to go in there. I want to wear that hat every day and just be like right. fabulously yeah, going around. You'd be fabulous. But do you think there's a slight concern? I mean, if I, I think what's, it does look different to the aesthetic that she had at Valentino, but there are similar, like the horoscope it things that like she's played to, yes. to before, you know, the nude, a sort of tool with the, with the embellishment over it, that kind of primness, you know, this, even like the little sleeves on the dress, that, you know, I, I where does this leave Couture week when you've got two houses that are now going to become relatively similar? Because I imagine that the Valentino show will well, I was going to say, let's see what uh, he does. What he does, yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's and I think they'll be different. I mean, it's, it's the big ball gowns, isn't it, that's a similar bit, and the capes. Mm, and yeah. The, yeah, the shapes. But I, I always think of the, the colour palettes maybe different. Oh, but mind you, sometimes I they do real neutral colours. The, the colour no, palette was similar and the delicacy of the sheer fabrics, but I do think that the shapes were quite different, especially the first part yeah. with the fuller skirts mm. and the capes yeah. and the little and jackets. The That's quite different to jackets, Valentina. Yeah. 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 And I think that it's bound to take a couple of seasons for what? the pair yes. of them to really mm. establish their own identity because they've worked together for so long. Yeah. So I, I think, agree. you know, maybe next year if we're asking this question yeah i do think the colors she's playing with it you know her 
her ready to wear was a completely monochrome, mm. you know, black and white, and this has been relatively neutral in that sense. Whereas with Valentino, you think red dress, you know, there is mm. more of a sense of colour, and I guess it, with Dior. That was that one, one red and one green and the dress? Green, yeah. The green, yeah. yes, that was quite Valentino in mm. feel. And we with some of the sugar plum fairy. Sugar yes. plum fairy. Yeah. That's the sugar plum fairy. I should have known that after watching that documentary mm. at Christmas. <laughs> I feel like this year I, my brain's had to take in so much more information that just everything is falling out of one of my ears. I don't know what's going on. I love that dress with that with the velvet coming down. Yeah. Mm. You would just, if you were getting married, you would just go there, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. The palette is, oh, rest- yes. is really restrained, actually, when you mm. look at it. It's not like a colourful collection, really. I, like, as you say, there's that flash of green and the mm. flash of red, but the main story is those kind of neutrals. Those mauve and old... Pastels. Mm. Yes. Amazing. But everything looks slightly like it could... It looks so modern, but also everything looks slightly like it could be from another era, which I think is quite... I think nice. it's otherworldly. Yeah. Mm. I think she's touched on so many... Um, <gasps> Elements. But they are quite it's wearable. Like you could imagine them flattering ah, women, yes. and so not women of feminine. just one particular shape, but yes. women of different sort of sizes. And <gasps> I think those opening looks are really interesting. Yeah, they're yes. very strong. But I think I also just think thinking sort of really big picture in fashion. I think what she's done as a designer, which is this kind of interesting focus on sort of modesty and the body being covered, it's just been really, really influential and it runs right down to high street stores. You know, when you look at like party wear in like the top shop or in ASOS, and like, yes, there are the kind of Balmain S flashy dresses, but then there's a huge amount of these kind of quite covered, mm. very surface heavy dresses. And I, and I think it's really interesting also like the kind of climate and the mood that her as a designer will set because this house has such an influence. Yeah, it's gonna be... That probably relates a bit to the clients as well, doesn't it? If you think yeah. that the Qataris owned Valentino for a while. Mm. I should think Bernard Arnault and his board are just rubbing their hands mm-hmm. with this. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's a good, Ching. Yeah. really good choice for them. Because she just proved herself such an able businesswoman as well, but, uh, which is what's so fantastic because often when you see a really beautiful, amazing collection by designing, you, you feel sorry for them in some ways because you're like, God, they must have poured their heart and soul into that. They must be so exhausted. Whereas you get the sense with her that she's got quite a lot of stamina and she's really good at the business side and she's very pragmatic. So I don't know, those concerns that you usually have around those sort of... There's sometimes something quite sad about Fashion Week is that you feel like everyone's like driving themselves crazy <laughs> and running themselves to the bone. And I don't know, there's just so much composure to sort of how she handles herself that you never completely feel sort of like desperately sorry for her. Have you and there don't seem to be that mm. many... Yeah. It's not a profusion of ideas in that collection. It's not like no. piled on, helter-skelter, different mm. silhouettes, different... There's a kind of evenness oh, and a restraint. Mm. But it's like being a CEO of a big company, you know, think of Bernard or is he walking around going, God, I'm so stressed, there's just so much to do. Yeah. I guess you get into a role like that and you have to sort of be the figurehead mm. and the leader. Maybe as Deborah said earlier, you don't get to do so much of mm. the designing or the day-to-day or the twirls or, mm. you know, you're looking at sketches. Mm-hmm. But, but I guess you have to resign yourself. And maybe that's where the conflict comes from when designers yeah. don't really want to do that. They'd rather be... With, you know, with the fabrics with the and draping mm-hmm. things. But maybe that's where her background has stood her in yeah. such good stead because the fact that she came from kind of a behind the scenes accessories S background, like really worked, as, like worked her way up, means that you're kind of used to in some ways having to compromise and not always having yeah. your, you know, if you're a designer who straight out of St. Martin's or, you know, Parsons or wherever you went, has your own label, you're never used to having to not get your not not get your own way makes them sound petulant but you're, you're never used to having to sort of work to a brief or discard an idea because it doesn't fit with something whereas I imagine she's quite used to like yeah working to a brief you know and having to sort of realize that her idea maybe doesn't quite work for this or doesn't quite work for that you know if you're working with someone else for so long and maybe she doesn't you know she's maybe she doesn't cut anyway know mm. how to pat I'm not saying she doesn't maybe she doesn't know how to pattern cut yeah. maybe she doesn't sketch a lot anyway so yeah. maybe that was a natural transition mm. Mm. I really like it fabulous yeah I'm sure we've got a very clear vision oh. for that round she's she's just a sensation it looks beautiful it's it's very, very nice. I wonder what people will make of it I wonder I imagine some people say it's too similar to Valentino but yeah it's interesting I'm I always think it's interesting how people respond to designers when they're new to an appointment and 
you know, whether because this feels quite attuned to what she did at Valentino, you know, whether she's going to get, you know, like with Alessandro Michele, Alessandro Michele at Gucci, because it was such a U-turn from before, that's why you see all these covers about him revolutionising fashion, mm. and, you know, his, everyone's falling over themselves to do an interview with him, and I wonder, because this is a, for her as a designer, from her old job to this as a kind of steady transition, whether she's going to get the hype and the acclaim that maybe a Demna Casalia or mm. a Alessandro Michele gets. Um, I remember when she and Pier Paolo launched, or, you know, did their first Valentino, um, and there was very mixed reception to that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people outright mm. really dissed it because it was a bit sort of clunky and there was no coherent thought. Mm. Mm. But it might be a bit too pretty for some journalists. Yeah, yeah, it's not edgy, is it? You, you yeah. know, um, yeah, who are kind of really embedded in fashion, whatever the hell that means. But I don't know, I just think looking at those, if you got to touch the fabrics and see mm. them made of stitch, I think it would blow you away. Yeah. You know? yeah. I think it would be beyond. When I was in the Valentino today, they were making, it was like for a calf, um, it was like sort of like a ribbon to go through the mm. calf. And they were rolling the fabric themselves and stitching it. Mm. And I was just looking at it being like, it's literally just going by a ribbon and they were making it. And it was yeah. so, it was like this tiny bit of a calf. <laughs> And I just thought, you know, just, can you imagine being able to wear clothes like that, wear that so everything? Nice. It just. Yeah. Well, she's making mm. clothes there, you're talking about the Oh, look, there's that funny mm. embroidery thing. It looks like a. What is that? Well, it's all star sign themed, so maybe, I don't know. Oh, I thought it was a, like a jellyfish or something. Yeah, or a squid. <laughs> yeah, a squid. A squid, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't think it's meant to. <laughs> no, but she has done that. She's put quite funny things on clothes. Put like, she did lobsters and stuff, so maybe it is. The haute couture squid. <laughs> <laughs> so we're impressed then we like what we've seen I'm impressed yes. I yes. think she's making clothes for women yeah. just to, to pick up on what you just said very quickly that I don't I think you know she might not be uh, changing lives and changing mm. the course of fashion mm. but I think she is really making clothes for yeah. women mm. and, and I think that's such a strength and and mm. and something really to celebrate she's you know, it's, an, it's Feminine, fabulous. Mm. flattering, fabulous. Beautiful. Oh, and fishy. <laughs> and fishy. <laughs> yeah. So will she put those shoes into production because they're couture? No. No, they won't they're go into nice, production. They are very nice. But you never know, maybe she'll do a similar style yeah. in the yeah. in the ready to wear. Mm. They were you lovely. just want them, they're quite you, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Looks I've got to get saving generally for this stuff. <laughs> Start saving okay. yeah. I mean, so I think some of those dresses you could be looking at eight figures or I think it's going to take me a while. It's going to take me a while. You never know. You could, when figures, you've saved yeah. up, you can come and do the panel. It'll be like 2026 20, and you can be there and you'll... You can wear yeah. it. Or make a fashion film. <laughs> but she's doing it. Myself. Perfect. <laughs> and on that bombshell, <laughs> shall we... Give her a round of applause for such a beautiful collection and giving us so much to talk about. Definitely.